Lines here from Total Wellness Health Coaching. Welcome back to my kitchen. I hope you, if you saw them, enjoyed those last couple videos, which were um, some clothing hauls, and then I had a Thrive Market unboxing. If you haven't seen those and you're interested, go back and look for those. I had some, I had a Transcend um, subscription clothing unboxing, and then I did a little Walmart haul, and those are always really popular. I enjoy watching that kind of thing, too. Um, and then we've had a couple other sourdough recipes, and that's what I'm back with again today. Um, we're going to make, we're going to attempt to make a pie crust using our sourdough starter. So you're going to join me as I experiment today. So I think I told you way back when I started this whole gluten-free sourdough journey, um, I was inspired by Lisa from the Farmhouse on Boone um, YouTube channel and blog. And so I have continued to go to her website for recipe inspiration. Now, her I think she may have a couple gluten-free recipes, but the majority of hers are not because her family is not gluten-free. Um, but her sourdough recipes for me, um, compared to others that I've seen, um, they're definitely the simplest and have been the most successful. And now I have had to tweak to make them gluten-free, um, but it has worked. And actually, I just realized I want something different. Let me grab a different flour. So as I am filming this, and hopefully as you're watching it, if we get our videos up promptly, it's early November, so we're thinking holidays, right? And I actually, I have you covered in the paleo department. If you just go back, um, I believe my channel was called Our Paleo Family at the time. You can find, so search Our Paleo Family Thanksgiving, and I walk you through the whole process of roasting a turkey and making the gravy and sweet potatoes and cranberry sauce and... I think apple pie and maybe another kind of pie, bread. I have all kinds of recipes that will help you get a really um, great paleo Thanksgiving dinner on the table. Um, and so I have done pie before. I'm hoping, as you see my apples here, to make an apple pie because my son has been begging for that. Um, and, and I have a great paleo pie crust recipe that I have shared with you before. Um, and I will try to link... Because my website and things have just evolved through the years, different things are in different places, so I can't just tell you off the top of my head for sure where you can find that recipe, but I think I know, and I will confirm where you can find the pie crust recipe, and I will link it for you below. So look for that. But this is using my sourdough starter. Ta-da! So we'll see if my cameraman can zoom in on this and see all of these lovely bubbles, which are... The life, it's the life in my sourdough. And it smells so good. I mean, it it smells like yeast bread is baking. Um, so let me just take you on a little rewind journey with the sourdough. Um, I showed you how I started my gluten-free starter and it was working and I was using it, la -ti da We went on vacation for a week, we got home and um, we got home, it was school starting and busy, 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 busy and I just, didn't have time to bake anything, and I, I left my starter in the fridge when I went on vacation because I knew it would be fine. I had parked it in the fridge for a week before, um, but I ended up leaving it for two weeks, and at the end of the two weeks, I was like, oh, I'm not really ready to use it yet. I just didn't want to mess with it, and so I left it in there, and I believe it was in the fridge for three to four weeks. Well, it completely went bad. It would, it would not last, and I have heard of standard sourdough, so meaning with gluten, starters living in, you know, a cold environment for months and surviving. And so I was just kind of hoping for the best, um, but expecting um, what was the reality, and, and that is that it did not survive. So I had to scrap that starter and start over. Well, um, one of you, or maybe a couple, actually had asked about a paleo starter. And so... There are maybe Bob, I think it's Bob's Red Mill, this brand, and this is just their gluten-free kind of one-for-one -one flour blend, but they have a paleo one as well, and it is crazy expensive. I refuse to buy it, even in the name of science or trying things out for the blog or YouTube channel, whatever. I will not buy it because it's all, I can't remember off the top of my head what's in it, but it's like tapioca and cassava and that kind of thing. And I just have all those flowers. I buy them by the pound or two pound. And it's way cheaper to mix up your own than to buy that paleo blend. These gluten-free blends have gotten fairly inexpensive. Um, if 
you buy from Thrive Market, that's the best price. And they will often put them on sale. Well, not often. A couple times a year, they'll run um, big sales on all their gluten-free stuff, all their paleo stuff, all their Whole30. They'll do things like that. And I tend to stock up at that time. Um, and actually, for years and years, I didn't use a lot of gluten-free flour. We were really strictly paleo. Um, but now we are doing more gluten-free stuff. Anyway, back to the sourdough. So I don't have like a, a blend like this that's paleo, but I have a lot of paleo flowers. And so I said, all right, I've got to start my starter again. Let me try to make it paleo. And it was a total fail. All the types of flowers I used, I used a combination because in baking, a combination of flowers um, with, when you're doing gluten-free or paleo baking, um, it almost always gives you a better result. Actually, I can't think of any example from the many, many recipes I've created where I really got a good result from only using one type of flour. Um, and my standard is almond flour and arrowroot. Um, but as they have come out with all these others like tiger nut and cassava and tapioca and all those, um, I have used others in my baking. But the old standard that almost always produces a nice result is almond and arrowroot. So I started with that. It molded in a couple days. You know, I did the whole same process where you feed it for a few days and then you start to discard some and feed it and discard and feed. This got very, very expensive very, very fast because these flowers are expensive. And as you know, everything is expensive right now. Groceries, gas, all of it. I just went to three grocery stores today and all the things I usually buy and I like I'm a really good bargain shopper. Things are like mostly the same prices, but things are not on sale. Like there are not many sales. There are some, I can't remember what it was, but it was not something I was buying. It just caught my eyes. I was walking down the aisle. Like the regular price was $3.89. It was on sale for $3.85. I was like, okay, you put a big yellow tag on there and you're telling me it's on sale and it's four cents cheaper, which um, we'll be happy and take what we can get. But anyway. I could not continue to experiment with the paleo starter. I tried several different combinations of flowers and all of them uh, by the end of day two or beginning of day three had seriously molded and I just had to throw it away. I was like, I can't do this anymore. My family is good with gluten-free. I know that it works and I'm going to start over. Well, so here's my new starter. With the, actually I'm going to scoop my lard that I need for my pie crust and um, put it in the freezer. I really don't want it sitting out because you want it to be ice cold. Um, this is not my favorite lard, so it's a little bit softer anyway. So let me get... Um, Lisa, again, from Farmhouse on Boone, hurt, sorry, I hurt my shoulder and I just, it's weird stuff like that. I can't, I can't reach over like that. Um, her recipe called for a cup and a quarter of butter, which that just, that seems like a lot to me. I, I can't imagine that I'm really going to need that much. This is a one and a half cup measuring cup. Um, so I'm going to put some in and stick this in the freezer. Um, and if I need more, I'll get more. Okay. Let me clean it and then I'll chill it. Okie dokie. So. When I made my first gluten-free starter, I explained to you that flour blend. I used like six or seven different flours, which again was awesome. It makes a very uh, nice product. This time I decided to be a little bit easier on myself and just see kind of will anything work. And so I used this King Arthur gluten-free measure for measure, which I like better than the Bob's Red Mill. Um, but I'm about out of this one, and so I had this bag in the back of my pantry, so I'm going to continue to use that. Um, so I used this King Arthur gluten-free blend. I used some teff and sorghum. Yeah, because I wanted to use rice, but I couldn't find my rice flour. So uh, I organized a lot of things this summer and cleaned up the cupboards, and I have put some things in some places that I can't find. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure that you have never done something like that. Um, I know that it's here, but I, I couldn't find it. It was not with all my other flowers, which was very strange. So, um, anywho, I used this one, teff, and sorghum. That's it. So, when I started it, you know, you feed it, feed it, and feed it. I would do, like, I would just rotate through. I would use this one, and then the next time I would use the teff, and then the next time I would use the sorghum, just to make it really easy on myself. And about day three, 
voila, my starter was alive and good and beautiful. And I have already um, baked with this. I made my scones again, of course, because they're everybody's favorite. They're so delicious. Um, I actually took them to my class this week. We were studying Pride and Prejudice, and so we had a tea party. And so, of course, I had to make scones. And none of them are gluten-free or anything. They're all just growing teenagers and will eat anything. Um, I say that they'll eat anything. No, they're actually really picky, but they, they love junk food. So they really don't want anything healthy. Um, and they loved my scones. I made um, cherry almond. Oh, they're so good. Anywho, I made my scones, and then I put this in the fridge, and it's been in the fridge for a week. And I was ready to bake today. I pulled it out this morning about 8 o'clock. It is now 2.30. Um, at 8 o'clock, I fed it. I, I did throw a little bit out away because I, um, I didn't want to have to feed it quite so much. So I took about a, a third of the volume. This is a four-cup measuring container. And I didn't even measure. I poured in, like, probably a half a cup of flour, this flour, half a cup of spring water. So I'm always using bottled water. Um, just because that's what a lot of people recommended. And I don't have a fabulous water filter. I have an okay one. So just to be safe, I'm using a good quality bottled spring water. Mixed it up. And by 1 o'clock, I checked it. I don't know what time it was good like this, but I checked it at 1. And it was nice and bubbly and alive. So if you have any questions about that, please ask me. Please ask me because, I mean, I'm still learning, but I have I have learned a pretty decent amount so far. So... Um, it's not going to be paleo because my my starter is not paleo. It's just gluten free. But I'm going to make my crust with um, mostly paleo flours, just because that's what I like the best. So I'm going to do um, a cup of almond flour. So Lisa recommended two cups of flour. We're going to just try it and see how that works. So. A cup of almond, a half a cup of arrowroot, and then I am going to use one cup, or sorry, half a cup um, of this all-purpose blend. I didn't need that. To make my total of two cups, and then a teaspoon of salt. So I'm going to mix these together. And then I'm going to work in some of that cold lard. And then my liquid is going to be a tablespoon of honey and a cup of my starter. So let me get my lard from the freezer. So if you've watched my other pie video or videos, honestly, I, I don't remember how many I, I have on here. Um, I've explained to you that my grandma taught me how to make pie crust. And you use your hands. You, you would not use a food processor or a blender or anything like that. That would be... That would be almost sacrilegious. So you start to work. Hopefully the overhead camera will show this. You just start to work your fat, which I prefer lard for pie crust. I think it makes the best pie crust. Um, you work your fat into your flour. Just using your fingers. I think when you use your fingers, you're less likely to overwork it. And this is a, a tender dough. So already I think that it was... Um, way more lard than, I, than I'm going to end up needing. So I'll tell you how I can tell um, if my ratio is correct. And if I need to add more flour, I'll add some more flour. Yeah, it's too, it's too gloopy. It probably only would have taken maybe a third of a cup of lard. Let me write this down. Um, so you have your crumbs. This is just way too, um, it's way too fatty. I can't even, I can't even demonstrate for you. It was just too much. If we end up with too much pie crust, never too much pie crust, um, we'll make what we call pie doughs in my family. You take the extra and you roll it out and um, put butter or ghee, whatever kind of fat you're eating, and um, sprinkle it with cinnamon and sugar. Again, whatever kind of sugar your family eats. So you want these coarse crumbs, which we have, but then you want to like take a handful of it and squeeze it together. It should stay together, but just a real light touch should break it apart. And this, it's too, it's too lardy. It needs, 
It needs a little flour. You know what? There's not much left in there. Let me just finish this up. I know I'm going to need it. I love to get both hands in because um, I feel like I can just really work it easier, work it through. It's faster. I was going through um, the Farmhouse on Boone website looking at sourdough recipes and this is how I picked the one I wanted to try. I picked the one that used the most starter because I hate to waste it, um, but I, I'm not just baking with it all the time. Okay, so now our crumbs are smaller, as you can tell. So I'm going to squeeze it together again. It stays together. There we go. Do you see that? Let me show it to you again. Just grab a handful, squeeze it together, and I'm not like, with all my might, you know. I'm just squeezing it lightly. But then I let go and it stays together, but just a real light touch, it breaks apart. That's what you want. That's what you want. Y'all have a, a tablespoon of honey, and because I just don't want to have to wash my measuring spoon, I know what a tablespoon of honey looks like. There we go. Okay, so instead of water, we're going to use our starter. Oh, can you see? It's so bubbly and alive. I am going to measure really well, so I can tell you for sure. This, um, this guy's too big. So her recipe, again, called for a cup of starter. So that was a quarter. Now we're at a half. I think it might take the full cup. I'm gonna I'm gonna start with three quarters, and we'll see what that's like. It needs to be enough to um, hold your dough together, but not be so goopy that it's like liquidy, right? You know what pie crust looks like. If you are watching this video, then I think you know what pie crust should look like. I'm so excited to try this actually. So then, what she recommends is that you. Um, do a long ferment to get really the benefits of the fermentation, which there are benefits of fermentation already in here. But to get more, you make your dough and then you let it sit on the counter for eight hours or overnight to ferment. Yeah, that's not enough. We need we need more liquid. And then, once it's fermented overnight, you would put it in the refrigerator to chill. It does help your dough to roll out um, nicer, nicer, is that right? More nicely, if you will chill it. And then you can roll it out and use it. And this was supposed to be a double crust pie, but remember, or double, double crust, two, two crusts. Um, do you recall that it was there was too much lard and I had to um, add extra flour? So now I'm at a cup and a quarter. That's going to be enough. And if for some reason it's not and I need a teeny bit more liquid, I will just add in a, a little bit of water. But I think this is going to be just the right amount. Yeah, this is nice. So you want a nice dough. You want to be able to form it into a ball. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and split it in two. Just because I want to be able to handle it easily. I want to feel it. I'll tell you what, that feels like that feels like a nice pie dough. So you know we're going to have to have a part two of this because I'm going to obey and I'm going to let it sit for a short amount of time. In fact, you know what I'll do? I have two, right? I'm going to take one and I'm going to put it in the fridge and I'm going to chill it and then I'm going to use it today. And the other one I'm going to allow to sit on the counter and firm it. Now, I think I need to feed this a little bit. There's, there's not a, uh-oh, I don't want, I don't want to get 
all of this in there. Um, I, I need to feed that so that it um, isn't so hungry. And then I'll cover those up and we'll get this one in the fridge. I don't know if you can see this. You can see the, like the marbling in that of the fat and it smells really good. I mean, it smells really good. Um, I, I'm very, very hopeful for this being a delicious pie crust. Okay, so do you want to see me feed my starter? I guess I should show you that. This is an old Pampered Chef bowl that has the um, measurements on the side, which I really love. So there's just about um, a half a cup of starter in there. So I'm going to feed it. I didn't use this one. With a half a cup of flour. And then I need a clean spoon or spatula. About the same amount of water. I usually just start stirring it and get it to the right consistency. I don't want it too wet. I don't want it too thick. So that's too thick. I need a little bit more water. And say I accidentally put in too much water, I just put in a little more flour, it'll be fine. This will actually be a good test because there was so little starter left, and we'll see if this Bob's um, flour works as well as the King Arthur, which I have an order about to start from Thrive Market, or um, about to finish, actually. And so I can order the, the correct one. Okay, so that's, that's how complicated feeding that was. I'm going to see if they can share a towel here. This one is really good because it's um, it's kind of thin, so it still lets the wild yeast come in, um, but it keeps out the bugs and the weird random stuff that might be flying through the air. Okay, that's it. Um, I will show you um, rolling this out and baking it in just a little while. Hang tight. Alrighty, I had to break out the apron because I knew I was pressing my luck um, with that one on before. So, got my apron on. Here's my half of the pie crust that has been chilling. And I need my arrow root. So, I sliced up my apples. I actually didn't even... I've gotten to where I am just winging it a lot more than I used to in the kitchen. And so I didn't even look at my apple pie recipe. I just cut up my apples. I put some lemon juice in there. Oh, I forgot my cinnamon. I definitely want that. Yeah, I put in cinnamon. Let me roll this out first. So this is the way I have done my paleo pie crust for a long time um, on a piece of parchment because it is kind of fragile. So I'm kind of hopeful that this pseudo gluten-free paleo sourdough version will not be as fragile um, but I wanted to go ahead and do it on the parchment anyway if nothing else it makes um, the cleanup of the counter a little bit easier I hate the way the parchment slides around but you know you can't have everything. It's going to make my counter easier to clean up and my crust easy to pick up. So it slides around on me a little bit. So be it. Okay, so I told you Grandma taught me how to make pie crust. This is Grandma's rolling pin. And she gave it to me when she was still living. And I was single. And I was in graduate school. And I was living in my own apartment. She um, and my grandpa came to see me. And she brought me a few things. And one of them was her rolling pin. And it is just so special to me. And of course, I said, how are you going to make pie? And she was at that point in her life where she wasn't making that much pie. But she said, I'll just get a new one. And she, so I'm from Ohio. And um, in Ohio, they have a lot of sales. Like here in North Carolina, you know, you'll see people have an estate sale, that kind of thing. But they have a lot of, like, farm sales up there. Um... And I guess it's kind of the same thing um, as an estate sale. But anyway, you know, the things that they have at those types of sales are regional. And so she could go to an estate sale and find a nice old wooden rolling pin. So she went and she found she found one for herself. Okay, so I'm just kind of testing that. It rolled out super easily. Super, super, super easily. 
So now remember, this one is not long fermented. I just made it and refrigerated it. So Lisa, again, Michael Buddies, Lisa, Farmhouse Home Boom, she, her recipe for the sourdough crust involved letting it ferment for eight to 12 hours. So that's what I've got going on in the bowl over there with half of this crust. So half of it is here. And it did kind of crumble on the edges, but it didn't crumble quite as badly as my completely paleo crust does. It actually, it really, it feels really nice. Um, and depending on how much I have left over, I may put crust or I may make, usually I make a streusel for my apple pie. I think there are as many ways to um, do the, the crimping, the edging, the edge part of your pie crust as there are people who make pie. But I'm going to do it the way Grandma taught me to do it. So I just kind of trim off the excess right, right at the edge. This particular pie pan has a handle, which is actually kind of nice for getting out of the oven, but I don't love it because I have to kind of work around that when I'm trimming off the excess. I just kind of pinch it. And if it's a part that's a little thin, I might put a little piece of dough on there or just kind of work with what I got. I'm just going to work with what I got. It's not going to be a super um, big edge on the crust. Does that make sense? Beautiful. It's really nice. That, was, that rolled out really nicely. Okay. I need to put a whole bunch of cinnamon in here. And I used some maple syrup, and I really should have used all um, granulated sugar. Um, I don't have a lot of maple sugar left, so I use some maple sugar and some maple syrup. It does just seem really juicy. Um, let me put in a little bit more arrowroot. I don't want it to be goofy. So these paleo thickeners, you just have to be really careful because They'll thicken, but they can they can just turn things kind of gummy. You don't want that. So this was two Honeycrisp, two Granny Smith, and one Gala. I'm pretty sure. And I didn't put any allspice or nutmeg or anything like that. It's just just cinnamon, which you saw me do. Kind of flatten those out. We can be rustic. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? So this is all the crust that I have left, which is not a ton. It's not a ton. You know what I think I'm going to do? Is I think I'm going to use it in my streusel topping. Yeah, yeah. We're experimenting, right? So let's experiment with this too. Okay, so here's what would go in my streusel topping. And again, this is like from memory. I'm just winging it. I definitely want some nuts. So these are pecans, which are my favorite to go with apple pie, but you could of course do um, walnuts would be really nice. I guess if you liked hazelnuts, that would be good. Um, my son is allergic, so we don't eat those. Um, any nuts that you like, but pecan is what comes to my mind. Um, so a streusel is gonna be butter, flour, probably nuts, some sugar, that kind of thing. Well, my crust is butter, not butter, is lard and flour, and then it has the sourdough. So I don't need to add as much butter as I normally would. So that was really only just about two tablespoons of butter. I'll leave it because I might need some more. I'm gonna put some cinnamon in and always want a little sprinkle of salt in, um, in your baking 
just a couple tablespoons of almond flour, and we'll kind of see. I didn't put any sugar in there. Okay, maybe sugar. Let's see what's in here. We got about a quarter cup. Uh, that's just use it all. This is my favorite maple sugar. It's Nova, and I ordered the, that from Amazon, so I can link that for you. I have ordered other brands. They're good, too. Um, that's just what they've had lately. You just want some sugar, you want some fat, you want some flour, I think some nuts, some cinnamon, a little salt. Let's see how this texture is. Uh, it's pretty crumbly, honestly, pretty like floury textured. I think I want some more butter. So I'm going to put in a couple more tablespoons. So a lot of times, um, like grandma would, you would call it dotting, just like put little bits of butter on top of the apples, but I don't need to do this. I should do that because I'm going to use the streusel. I don't know if you can see it in there. It's not moving as much. It's definitely um, a better texture. Yeah, that looks great. I'm still fasting, so I'm not eating yet today, so I'm not tasting, but um, it's pie crust and it's pecans and it's butter and flour and cinnamon, so like, what could potentially not taste good about this, right? I mean, it, it would not taste bad, so I don't have any hesitation about going ahead and putting this in the oven without tasting the streusel. So I'm just going to dump it on. Why not? Right? Just put it all on there. And then I'll spread it around. And kind of even like press it down in the apples a little bit. I mean, I love a two crust pie, but that's just, when I originally made my paleo apple pie recipe, I didn't do two crust because all the paleo ingredients are so expensive. I don't want people to have to use that much almond flour and it's rolling out two crusts and that's stressful for some people. So I was trying to, you know, make it a very user friendly recipe. Um, so I think the streusel is really good, but you could just as easily have used your whole crust and done a double crust. Okay. Doesn't it look pretty? It looks so pretty right now. Um, my oven is 425. The way I always do a fruit pie is I started at 425, the lowest rack of my oven, just for like 10 minutes. And then I reduce the heat to 325, move the pie up to the middle, and until you can pierce your fruit with a knife and there's like no resistance, so it's really soft, then it's done. So I'm going to put this actually on my little pie rack thing in case it bubbles over so I don't have to clean up that mess. And then it's going to go in the oven. And I will show you the whole thing when it's totally done. And I will then also give you an update on the more fermented crust and compare the taste means I'm going to have to make another pie. I wonder if my family will mind. <laughs> Just kidding. Maybe we'll make chicken pot pie. We'll make a savory pie. All right. Thanks for joining me in the kitchen today, everybody. If you liked this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe. Even if you subscribed before, just hit the subscribe button again. It will tell you if you were already subscribed um, because, you know, people just get unsubscribed randomly. So definitely subscribe. Leave me a comment. Say hi. I love to hear from you all. I hope you're doing well. Um, if we don't interact again before the holidays, I hope you have a wonderful holiday season. And I look forward to catching up with you again when it's time. All right. Have a great day, everybody.